Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh, and I am excited to have this opportunity to talk to you tonight about the newest, and I wish I could say the greatest, but we'll just say the latest information on COVID and the pandemic that we have all been living with for about two years now. So just a quick recap about Omicron. It is a variant of the original strain that we dealt with back two years ago. Viruses are known to mutate and create new strains or variants. And as that happens, they can potentially evade immune systems that have already learned to fight off previous versions. And that is where we're at now. Not only the immune system dealing with previous versions of the virus, but also the vaccines. So if we go back at the beginning when the vaccines were introduced now just about two years ago after the ending of the initial studies and the initial approval for emergency use authorization of the messenger or M RNA vaccines. Those were the first two that came out, particularly the Pfizer was the first one that came out. That is the vaccine that I received my first dose at the very tail end of December and three weeks later I got my second dose. So the messenger RNA vaccines were designed as a recap to create antibodies in the recipient of the vaccine to what is called the spike protein. The spike protein is a part of the coronavirus that we're dealing with, the SARS-CoV-2, that is involved in creating a false, we'll call it entry point, false in terms of it creates a receptor out of what is the ACE2 enzyme system. It's not truly a receptor. It becomes a receptor or an entry port for the virus into cells. And the messenger RNA vaccines are brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. They created a scenario whereby by putting in the messenger RNA, it allowed the body to then outside of the nucleus of the cell, no entry into the nucleus whatsoever to allow transcription of actual the um, spike protein in cells that the person's immune system would then create antibodies against. And when you got the second dose, it would create what would be hoped to be a somewhat permanent state of immunity whereby antibodies would be produced in that individual against the spike protein, thereby preventing the entry of this virus into cells. And initially, it was extremely successful, over 90% successful in preventing actual infection that led to any symptoms. But over time, this virus, like so many other pathogens, is outsmarting our vaccines and our science. And we're, though we're working really hard to deal with it, but over time, different variants came out that could somewhat reduce the efficacy of the vaccine. However, and also I just want to mention that time also reduced the body's immune system's response and therefore immunity waned, it decreased. But here's the bright news. By getting the booster vaccine, which most people, most ages are now encouraged to get, it boosts up the immunity and it turns out that although these vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines, and I'm not, I'm not gonna even talk about the J&J &J because that's really not going to be in the picture any longer. That's a different mechanism. It's an adenovirus vector. We're not gonna even talk about that. The messenger RNA vaccines, which were the dominant vaccines received in the United States, and they included the Moderna and the Pfizer, and the Pfizer was more prevalent in terms of its use, those vaccines are still effective, not in preventing infection, although probably to some degree in reducing infection, possibly in reducing infectivity or spread of the virus. Those are areas that it's much, much weaker in now than it was with the initial 
type of strain of this virus. But in terms of preventing hospitalization and death, it is still extremely effective. So yes, it is disappointing that it doesn't prevent infection. It doesn't absolutely prevent in any way transmissibility, but if it helps dramatically to reduce serious illness and death, that is still a big advantage to every individual who gets this vaccine. And that's why this message it's to encourage everyone to get a booster, which is now not even called a booster. It's considered a three dose series. And many vaccines require three doses. So this isn't unique and it's not a failure, it's an evolution. And we need to distinguish between when things are failed and when things are evolving based on trends, evolving science, and just things changing. We have to be responsive to change. That's called being smart. So think of it instead of a booster, think of it as the third dose in a series of three. Now, whether there'll be a fourth dose as a booster, that is possible. And so be it if it is. It's a small price to pay to stay out of hospitals and ICUs. I am in Orange County, California, where our data is very available and very transparent. What I wanna give you is our local data. In Orange County, California, in terms of hospitalizations, they're higher than they've ever been at over a thousand patients hospitalized with COVID right now. Of the patients who are hospitalized in Orange County, California, 85% are unvaccinated of hospitalized ICU, intensive care patients, 88% of those in the intensive care are unvaccinated. With every drug, there is what is called an NNT, number needed to treat. How many people need to receive that drug? And I'm gonna call a vaccine a drug, it's really in the family. How many people need to receive that drug, or in this case, a vaccine, to actually have benefit? Well, it depends what you call benefit. If it means that your illness will be less severe, then that's not a really, really high number needed to treat. If you say to stay out of the hospital, that is going to be a higher number. If you say to prevent death, then it really will be quite a high number, especially for younger people, because still the majority of people who have died from COVID, from this pandemic in the United States have been over the age of 65. That's a fact. That is a group that has a more vulnerable immune system. But if you look at illness and other bad outcomes, it's still not zero. It's still about 25 to 30% of the affected people who end up in hospitals and even dying are younger. Now, the reality is that very young people rarely, rarely die. So the number needed to treat, how many people need to be receiving the vaccine in order to prevent death, it's going to be very high. I couldn't even tell you what the number is, but you're taking this vaccine both to lower your risk, and this is where I'm telling you, I did not come up with this, but it's called the death lottery. Now, in California, we do have a lottery system to get money. Sometimes these lotteries will have 200, 300, I think the highest is close to $500 million in the lottery. Somebody wins that your chance of winning that is incredibly remote. It's really remote, yet still people buy a lottery ticket and hope they'll be that one. So that is, we'll say, the financial lottery, okay? Now, the death lottery means that your chance of dying from COVID is small. But if you lose, it's not like you don't win the money, you lose your life. So everything in life when you'd make a decision in medicine, I should say, the medical life, 
is risk benefit ratio. What do you have to gain versus what do you have to lose? Now, clearly, older people have more to lose because their risk of dying or becoming seriously ill is higher. But if you're younger, there still is a risk. It's not zero. What's the risk of having an adverse event from the messenger RNA vaccines? Incredibly low. Now, a lot of attention has been spent on myocarditis, which has occurred in younger males predominantly. Well, what's the real risk? Well, we now have data. The risk of getting myocarditis is one in one million for people receiving the vaccine. What about for people who get infected with the virus? Six in one million. They're both rare, but which is more rare? It's one sixth the risk of getting myocarditis, which by the way, in the vast, vast majority of cases is very mild and just resolves completely, total healing. So the risk of these vaccines is incredibly low. The risk for most people of dying is also low. But when you still compare risk benefit ratio, the benefit by far outweighs the risk. If you can reduce your risk of entering into the death lottery, do so. I can tell you there have been a number of young, healthy, low risk people who have died in my own area of the country because they were the unlucky ones in the death lottery. Now, what about also helping to prevent people who have really high risk, people who have immunosuppressant issues, they have had organ transplants, they're on chemotherapy. Well, even if you lower your risk of transmission a little bit because your viral load is less and your viral time of infectivity is less, that's still a benefit when you add in the huge numbers of people involved. So when you're dealing with huge numbers, even a little benefit can have a big benefit society-wise. When the risk of taking these vaccines is so incredibly low and the risk of benefit is significant, then we should have the vaccine and get the third dose. In my area, and I know this is true elsewhere in the country, the pediatric hospitals are overflowing. We have a local pediatric hospital called CHOC, Children's Hospital of Orange County. It is mobbed. It's a mob scene with kids, ill kids, hospitalized kids. One of my patients, her daughter's six-month-old daughter, so my patient's daughter's daughter, just got out of Children's Hospital here in Orange County with COVID pneumonia at the age of six months of age. Her dad got the virus, we think, we can't prove it, from a co-worker who refused to wear a mask and then came in and found out the very next day was positive. And we know that you can be infectious before you have symptoms or when you even have no symptoms. And a mask is still beneficial. Is it foolproof? Absolutely not. It is not foolproof but it is helpful. The original COVID variety, when you wore a mask, it added protection of about 80%. So a mask was about 80% protective when you wore it for the first variation of COVID. When you got to the Delta strain, that variant, the mask was probably 50% effective because it was more transmissible. It's a more contagious type of virus. When we're dealing with Omicron, which is now multiple times more infectious than even Delta, the mask is not as effective. We don't even know exactly, but we'll say somewhere between 25 and 45% effective. When you add in all the people that could be wearing a mask, that could prevent one baby or a small child that they're not eligible to get any vaccines. There are no vaccines for the babies, for the under fives, and they are filling up our children's hospitals. Few of them die, thank goodness, 
but it changes a child's life when they're hospitalized. We know that it can affect their emotionally and the parents emotionally forever. And of course, there can be lasting sequela. And what about the people who have very poor immune systems? We want to protect them we can reduce the risk of contagiousness to some degree with wearing a mask. I spent a great deal of my career wearing a mask because I did surgery and I did deliveries and I wore a mask. It never bothered me one iota. So the bottom line is I want to just drive home the point that there is tremendous value in getting the third dose and if you haven't gotten the first or the second, getting the vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, so you don't enter the death lottery. Also, you don't want to end up in the hospital. You don't want to be sicker than you have to be. And you certainly don't want to infect someone who can really end up in trouble. So wear a mask, do all the proper things. Don't go out if you have symptoms, whether you can get a test or not, and hopefully you can. If you have COVID, follow the CDC guidelines and quarantine for the appropriate amount of time based on your symptoms and so forth. Now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk the next time. I'm going to talk about the newest therapies available because there are some new ones. There's some antivirals that are coming out. I wanna to talk to you about the pros and cons and if there's even any benefit to any monoclonal antibodies. I wanna tell you about the latest information about ivermectin and about some of the SSRIs that are now being requested for emergency use authorization. I want you to understand what is real, what is science, and what may be false rumor so that you can make an informed decision about what course of action you want to take for yourself and for your family to help guide them as well. So I look forward to seeing you. Stay well. See you soon. Bye.